anyway, uh, thank you all uh, again. Uh, I think uh, it is the end of the uh, of the triennial, so we're you know we uh, use this opportunity for two reasons. One um, is that uh, as a licensed alarm dealer in the state of New Jersey myself, I know uh, sometimes you get to that end game and you need a few extra credits, and uh, we were looking at a way to to, uh, to to get in front of people who needed those extra credits and 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 with a with a message. Um, and the second thing was that uh, I actually, I actually designed this class, and some of you probably read the email that I sent out about it. And so I'm, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I, I'm gonna. Basically, it came from an idea uh, that I had over a year ago. Um, uh, you, if you guys don't know me, by the way, I should probably start. I'm I'm Dwayne Wareheim with uh, with Napco. I I run the southern region of the United States. I'm sure a lot of you didn't realize you're in the South. This is actually the South. Um, uh, it's kind of an interesting configuration they have that uh, the Mid-Atlantic falls into the southern region, but it's kind of because I live here. I'm a New Jersey guy from, from up north. Um, but as I, t I travel the United States, I go through a lot, of the, a lot of this country, I kept hearing two different stories, okay? Um, I would go to some dealers who would just essentially be fed up with the state of this industry today and what's happening and the marketplace and how everything seems to be uh, uh, becoming less and less profitable and their business is becoming harder. It's harder to get new business, harder to keep business, and how life is just really becoming more difficult. And some people who've been doing this for a very long time are saying, you know what, it may be time for me to just hit the road because this, this is a different industry than I'm used to. And I, I hear this story, and I, and I say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I wish I could have better answers for you. Then I go down the road five miles, and I talk to another uh, dealer who is just slammed with work, cannot keep up, uh, is, uh, is looking for people in a lot of cases. And um, I, I, we sit there, and we start talking, and, I, and, and it, it's the same business model. You know, they're the same kind of company. And as a result of that, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of started hitting me, like I said, o over a year ago, that, that, there's, that there's a messaging issue here. Um, people are missing an opportunity that I think is out there for the entire business. It's just we have to look at it different. We have to see things differently. And maybe we have to make some changes in how we do things. Um, so what I did was, over the course, like I said, of this time, I started putting together my ideas and, and, and piecing them together and trying to create something. And over time, I ran it past a few people. And um, pretty much everybody said, yeah, sounds like a good idea. Nobody gave me any help, but I kept doing it. So what you're getting today is essentially my opinions. Okay, I am starting out from the concept that you're getting Dwayne's opinions on what is a good idea and, and on the, what's happening in the market today what's happening uh, uh, in, in, in some of our businesses, in particular certain market segments, um, and of course uh, what you are doing uh, to, 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 to take advantage of those opportunities, different ideas and suggestions that, that I have found um, as I go around the country are working for people, uh, are working for some dealers. So uh, this, is a, this is a unique thing for me. Uh, normally, uh, as I've been with NAPCO now, a um, little over six years now, uh, I've always presented uh, basically PowerPoints that were created for me by our marketing department. It's the first time I actually did it myself. So uh, I've been doing it. This is, this is actually the sixth time. Uh, Lise and I have, uh, have gone all over the state. This is our, this is our last stop. And uh, we've done this, as Lise calls it, as Seminar Palooza <laughs> over the last two weeks, again, to help you with the CEUs but also to, 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 to hopefully uh, start this message. And the reason we're doing the videotaping today uh, is essentially because uh, the, the people I've been talking to, not only at the seminars, but people about the idea, um, I'd like to be able to, to spread the message a little further to see if it's something that, that resonates with people. Because I really believe, honestly believe, that the opportunity is huge for us today. And I just think a lot of people, unfortunately, um, uh, don't, don't see it. And I, I want to hope to make that. Uh, the title, sales, sales Boot Camp, Beating the Big Guys, this is a sales presentation. I am a salesman. I, uh, I am technical enough to be dangerous. I've, I am a licensed alarm dealer, as I mentioned, so I know uh, how to put in alarms. Uh, I know how to program yeah. alarms. You do not want me to wire your house, uh, but uh, I, can, uh, I can do that if I'm forced into it, uh, probably not very well. 
Um, but I, as a sales guy and a sales manager now for a while, it, 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 you know, what you're going to get is my sales perspective on things. So I think I've got a pretty good handle on how best to really take advantage of this. And if, if, you, if you take the time you know, to listen to what I have to say, and you think there's some good ideas in there, try them out. Um, if you have suggestions, please uh, add on. So before we get started, housekeeping points here. Um, obviously, phones. Uh, if you have a phone, if you turn it off, turn it on, vibrate. Um, if you need to take a phone call, uh, please leave and take the phone call. I have no problem with you walking out and taking a phone call. Uh, I do every class, it seems like, have somebody thinks that they can take a phone call really quietly and nobody's going to hear them. It, it, you know, it's, it's a room full of guys. It's better if you, if you actually not all oh, guys, there's some women here as well, um, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, just keep everybody uh, so they don't, you know, be courteous. Um, a lot of instructors really don't care if you pay attention. Uh, half the class falling asleep or, or leaving and whatever and doing their computer the whole time. I'm one of those folks who actually do um, care a little bit that you pay attention. Not that I'm going to sit there and do a test at the end, uh, but I do think that there's some points here and I think you're here for this reason, so I would like your attention while you're here. Um, so uh, please kind of keep your conversations to a minimal and, and if you keep talking, then the way I typically deal with it is I'll stop and let you finish your conversation, and then so the rest of us can keep going, okay? It's just, just kind of a strategy that seems to work that kind of makes the point. Um, we do have breaks. There's going to be a couple of breaks in this, in this uh, four-hour class. Uh, so uh, if you uh, can wait to a break to, to make phone calls, go to the bathroom, whatever, great. Um, that's no problem. But if you need to go to the bathroom, if you need to do something, go out and do it, like I just said. Uh, however, note that if you are gone too much, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to issue credits. Uh, I did ha do this last Tuesday. I had a guy show up late for the class, which was, which was okay. It wasn't overly late. And then shortly after the class, he started, he started going out and talking to people and, and whatever. And I, I told him, I said, I, I, I'm not going to be able to give you credits if you don't sit through the class. So that's it. The last piece here is the fact that this class is interactive. Um, it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> Some classes tend to be more talkative than others, have more comments, questions, uh, input uh, than others. You're welcome to ask questions. You're welcome to, uh, uh, to, uh, to make comments uh, on, on what I have to say. Like I said, these are my opinions. Um, I actually encourage it. The one thing that is going to be uh, kind of important, though, is it is a full, hour, full four hour class. So the longer that the dialogue and discussion goes on, it's probably the longer the class is going to take. So, um, and we do want to get, keep going because we've got an awesome class this afternoon with Lisa on our fire radio and our fire panel. Okay, so as this is the first course I've ever done before, I, there's a format that you're supposed to follow. And one of the, uh, uh, the pieces, the very first piece of it, is what, what's your objective? What is, the, what, is, what is the reason for this course? What are you going to get out of it? So I actually thought that was a good place to start. I wrote this up. Um, at the completion of this course, the trainee will understand how changes in the alarm industry are offering unprecedented opportunities for growth. The course will offer strategies for business success using marketing concepts, sales techniques that take advantage of competitive advertising, niche opportunities, and professional differentiation. So that's the overview of what we're trying to accomplish today. The intended audience, which is also a piece of that, uh, is uh, professional security companies, highlighted professional in big letters, company, company owners, sales managers, representatives. Uh, I actually thought, you know, since professional seems to be a big word and a big theme in this, in this uh, presentation, I thought I should probably look up professional and have a nice dictionary definition. So of course the first, uh, I go into dictionary.com and the first line says working in a profession is a professional. So I, 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 I discarded that as being not in my view what, what I consider to be professional. Um, so I call a professional a person who is an expert at his or her work which was also on there. And it's a, kind of funny this word expert because um, only a few weeks ago I was actually at a family gathering and I, I, I sort of was talking to one of the folks there and we uh, we're men I mentioned to him that I, this is actually my 36th year in the business. I hit 35 years in January doing, doing this business. And, um, and so he said, well, you're, you're an expert at what you do. I go, you know what, I actually had never thought about that as applying to me, but I guess to a certain extent I'm, I've been doing this long enough to where I, I, uh, I do know enough to, 
uh, to, uh, to talk to a room full of what I consider to be professional alarm dealers and, and you guys care what I think. So I guess to a certain extent that, that, uh, that makes, me, uh, makes me an expert. Um, the, one of the things that I learned early on, I, I've been doing public speaking for a lot of years, okay, and, um, and I was in debate in high school and college, and one of my early debate uh, teachers told me that uh, uh, there's a rule to giving a speech or a presentation. Uh, the first thing you do is you tell them what you're going to tell them, uh, then you tell them, and then at the end you tell them what you told them, and if you're lucky, they may get 25% of it, uh, because honestly, everybody's got a dialogue going on up here. Everybody, me too, you know, I mean, all of us have a dialogue going in our heads, and sometimes we get lost in our own dialogue and miss some of what's going on uh, up on stage. And I, so I don't expect anything different than, what, what the, than the way we're humans as, as a result, but uh, I, I think it's important to kind of, again, tell you where we're going and what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do, and hopefully this will pique your interest enough to where you'll pay a little closer attention. First off, we're, talk, we're going to talk about the current state of the alarm industry, both good and bad, uh, why you must adapt to changing market conditions. And notice I put must in capital letters and underlined it because your choice is not to stay stable. Stay the same is a choice, and it's a choice that will cost you money. Um, why the opportunity right now, right now, today, is better than it ever has been. And I know that I'm going to meet, I immediately usually hear scoffing in the audience like, yeah, right, sure, uh huh. Um, and that's what I'm going to try to prove to you. Um, how you can employ proven techniques to grow your business, okay? Um, and how to not only compete with the larger companies in this business, but to beat them at their own game, okay? I think that's definitely doable, okay? And I hopefully you'll, you'll get the same impression as we go forward. And finally, at the end of the day, this can still be profitable because that's what we do this for. We need to make a living in the process and fun, enjoyable, that we can actually have a good time at it. It's not as onerous and horrible as, 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 uh, as many in the business seem to think it is. Okay, so let's get rolling. The numbers are bigger than ever, okay? Now these numbers are, again, from my experience here. Uh, when I started the business in 81, uh, I remember having conversations with a lot of the uh, major vendors. I was working for C&K at the time, and uh, our industry market share was 4%. So four out of every 100 facilities, buildings in the United States, residential, commercial, industrial, all of them together, four out of every 100 had an alarm system. Okay, And those were the carriage trade, we call them. The, the wealthy people and the businesses who had the money and, and uh, th stuff to protect that uh, an alarm system would provide. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a fairly limited market, mostly because all of our systems were in the thousands of dollars. It was an, it was an expensive entry point. Everybody loved it because we were all getting a lot of money on every install, new and, new and old. Today, however, due largely to these lower price systems we'll talk about in depth today, um, market share is 25%. So right now, according to current statistics, one out of every four buildings in the United States has an alarm, an electronic alarm system. Whether it's working or not, I, I, who knows, but they have, they have an alarm system. And the large companies, and this is really the news, when they talk about the large companies that we're going to talk about quite, quite a bit, um, they have estimated that it could potentially double in the next 10 years. Double. Okay, so, so let's do a little just backwards thought here for just a second. So we have 25% market share that we have accumulated over, well, ADT started in the late 1800s, okay? So we have all these alarm systems that have been installed all over the United States in all these different facilities. And according to this estimate, we're going to put in an equal number in the next 10 years. That is just astronomical. Now, even if they're wrong, which they could potentially be very wrong, I mean, maybe it's only going to go up 50%. Still, the numbers are massive. They are huge. And as a result, if we're there, if you're in the right spot, everyone knows timing is key. If you're in the right spot, and we are, you can take advantage of that. So this is a huge, huge opportunity because of the, because of the size of the numbers. And no matter what you think, the opportunity is bigger than ever in this particular business because, A, there's more systems going on, and because we have higher monitoring rates. Um, Commercial as well. This, this presentation is largely going to be residential, but I try to c 
cover commercial as well because I think commercial is very important. The reason it's going to be largely residential is because my background when I was doing it is, was mo largely residential, so a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, points that I have come from, from that as well. But code requirements are forcing fire alarm system installation all over the United States in places where it wasn't required a few years ago. Uh, building is picking up. Maybe not as much in this marketplace as it is in others. I mean, I, I was down in Nashville a couple weeks ago, and I can tell you Nashville is booming. There's 20 cranes downtown building alar uh, uh, apartment buildings, and Nissan just moved down there, and it's just it's crazy the amount of business going down there. Other marketplaces as well. New Jersey's not as good, but there is building happening now. And finally, this whole legacy base of, 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 of systems that have been installed over the years are starting to age. So there's a lot of maintenance, a lot of upgrade opportunities out there that, that exist. So the opportunity is bigger than ever. And my, my sort of you know, uh, message to you today is sprint, OK? That means don't sit back in the easy chair and wait it out. Take advantage of the opportunity while, it, while it's available. Uh, whether you are in this business for a long time, whether you're younger and you're going to be doing this for 20, 30, 40 years in the future, or you have an exit strategy that you plan on getting out of this and, and retiring or whatever, this is a time when you really should think about taking advantage of this opportunity. This is, it's really big. Don't miss your share of this bull market before you retire, before you exit. Okay, I really believe this. So let's talk about the competition. The names are really scary. Now, forever since in this business, the name that we all knew and, and, uh, and looked at as the big uh, gorilla in the room was ADT. I mean, and they're huge. And now they've even gotten bigger. Uh, even though they split with Tyco, Tyco did commercial. They went to residential. Now they combined with, this, uh, with Protection One and ASG, two other top Ten uh, companies. If you look at the SDM 100 list of the biggest companies in the United States, uh, so ADT is still a major player in this business and will be for obviously a very very long time. But look at the other names: AT&T, Comcast, Verizon. Names that really are not known for the alarm business, but now they're in our business and they're in our business seriously. And that's really a lot of what scares people. Just, I mean, that all of a sudden now I have to compete with Comcast, you know, who has thousands of employees just in the state of New Jersey to be able to compete with. It's, 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 it's very daunting. And then Google and Apple are getting into this business. I mean, Apple's already got the home kit out there. Google bought Nest and they bought Dropcam. So they're seriously looking at what we're doing. And, we, and I know, uh, I've heard from people who are insiders that uh, Google is really very seriously working on a security offering as well. So, so this is something that is really important, uh, that was really big, that's really impacted our, our industry in a lot of ways. So the question, I guess, is, is if you're looking at this from the alarm guy who's been doing this for, you know, for 30 years and you say, you know, why, why all of a sudden, I mean, the, econ the market's not that great. Why are all these people getting into this business? Why is it such a big deal? Why are this big money? Because we're talking big money. We're talking financial bean counters uh, extraordinaire are saying, hey, you better be in the security business. Why, why do you think that is? Well, we, all, we all know the answer. The answer is recurring revenue. They're here for recurring revenue. The gift that keeps on giving. 2008 was a wake-up call for a lot of businesses around the United States that don't have any kind of ongoing revenue stream. All of a sudden, building stopped. If you're in the trades and building stopped, your income went from here to here. And there wasn't any alternative source. Alarm dealers actually continued to do pretty well. I mean, I'm not saying we all got rich. We all paid the price. 2008 hurt this entire country, no doubt about it. But the fact is, is that we kept getting the checks from a lot of our, our, our customers because First off, they have come to learn and value their alarm system. Secondly, is that we kind of all know, and customers and users know as well, that when the economy dips down, typically crime goes up. And so that's not the, be that's not the time to be cutting off your alarm system is when the economy's crashing and all of a sudden burglars or, or people who are potential burglars are, are, now, are now out of work. So the bigger the recurring revenue numbers, of course, the happier they are. Uh, volume, lots of volume, lots of new customers. We all know the numbers, the, the big numbers of accounts they're adding. Higher monthly fees, the numbers go, keep getting bigger and bigger for uh, adding all these additional services and such. Um, 
And of course, these companies, all of them, love, love the, uh, uh, the contracts that lock these people in for years to continue paying the bill. And then that lovely little clause in the contract that says, you know, if you don't, you know, renew or if you don't cancel by this time, we're going to renew for another year. And they, they love this stuff. It's like money that keeps on giving. My, one of uh, my boss actually attended a, a seminar that was uh, held for the big financial gurus of the industry. And, and actually ADT was getting a hard time at this particular con uh, uh, conference I was t he, he mentioned. He said that, uh, that they were saying, looking at ADT and saying, you know, why are your rates half of what Vivint's are? I mean, you know, what, what, what are they doing that you're not? You know, I mean, so, so there's a lot of big money looking at this business saying, hey, how can I get it my, the biggest advantage out of it? So the enemy of recurring revenue, though, and the enemy for all of these companies and all of us in this room is attrition. You know, uh, people move. They, uh, they lose their jobs and have to cancel, or they... Um, they, uh, they, some people, sometimes they, they pass away. So you, you do lose business because of attrition. And it's not good for anybody. Um, so what the big companies do like is that, is that the security and additional pieces that we provide, the video and the remote access and all these kinds of things, make the customers sticky. They decide to, they, they decide to, to stick with that bundle to not cancel their service on for example, uh, their television and go to streaming video because they get these other services like their security or their, or their video cameras or something like that from, from the companies. Um, and they are happier because as a customer, as we, we've heard over and over again, they like this bundle. They think they're getting a better deal because it's all bundled into one big, one big number that they pay as opposed to paying this and this and this and this. Um, Surprisingly, and this will surprise a bunch of you guys in the room, I represent the alarm, uh, NAPCO on the Alarm Industry Communications Committee. Okay, that is a, uh, a committee of the Central Station Alarm Association. It's the UL listed central stations of the United States. A lot of big alarm companies, as well as COPS, is a member. Um, so a lot of these major uh, uh, companies are members. And um, this, the, a couple of months, excuse me, a couple months, about eight months ago, there was a uh, uh, woman who attended, who was a who was a presenter, and uh, she was there uh, to talk about the Internet of Things. You guys have all have heard about that. It's the, it's like what we're doing with Z-Wave control. Your Internet's using to actually control things in, in your house, your business, or whatever. And she was saying the 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 good news for this industry is that security is the key. Their research had determined that the thing that people really want is security. All this other stuff is peripheral. The primary thing that people want with this in the Internet of Things is security. And so we are at really in the, the, uh, the bullseye of where, uh, of where the, uh, this, this opportunity exists. Um, the drivers, remote services, video, um, alarm management, remote management, um, are all big. Automation is growing. It's still uh, uh, in process. Uh, it's not nearly as big as the rest of it, but it's, but it's growing and they project it will continue to grow. So attrition is, the, attrition is the enemy of recurring revenue. The enemy of your enemy is your friend. It is my opinion that attrition provides us the biggest opportunity of all right now. And while it is, it is a horrible thing for all of us that we lose customers and that they cancel, the fact is most of us, and from what I, again, a lot of it's anecdotal evidence from talking to dealers like yourselves, most everybody's in the 6 to 8% annual attrition level where you get, lose a small percentage. These larger companies, however, are double digits. Their, their attrition rates are huge. I'm not going to quote any because I really don't know for sure what the numbers are, but I've heard high double digits in some cases. Now, I might mean double digits, not like 80%, like maybe 17 So I don't know that to be the case. But it, it's true that, that this, the numbers are huge. So let's do a little math. If we have AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, ADT, uh, Google, Apple, throw all the names that, that are in there now and coming in. We throw the millions of alarm systems that these companies are going to be generating by, getting, by advertising and promoting and all the different things that they do to create business. And then we multiply that number times a very conservative 10% okay, attrition rate. 
That is hundreds of thousands of alarm systems that are falling off every single year. Okay, so I've given this course now, this is like I said, the sixth time. And I've asked this question five times, so this will be the sixth time. How many dealers, now uh, uh, the only guy who actually said before is the guys who just started. So we got a couple of new, new dealers in the room, so that, that kind of skews the number. Um, how many dealers in the room have not gotten business from the large companies? Has anybody not gotten any business from ADT or Comcast or Verizon? Nope. We're all getting it. We're getting their left leftovers right now. We're getting them right now. But they're calling you. Why aren't you calling them? Why aren't you reaching out to them? Why aren't you marketing to them? Why aren't you trying to let them know that, hey, you don't have to pay huge amounts to XYZ alarm company. You can pay it to me, your local dealer. The no cost and low cost systems have made it incredibly hard to compete. These big companies have incredibly deep pockets. Can you compete? I, I go, as I go around the company, I act, our country, I actually talk to a lot of alarm dealers who are trying to compete. And some of them are actually doing a pretty good job of it because they've developed systems to allow them to. Do you have the cash flow? Some people do have a good recurring revenue base that they can afford to do a certain amount of this freebie, low cost systems in order to try to compete and try, and try to get some of the business away from these bigger companies on new installation. Or are you willing to finance? Go to a third party who's willing to, willing to pay uh, to help you uh, be able to finance these alarm systems for these, for these companies. I mean, can you compete? My question is, do you need to? Do you need to compete? Some dealers who charge for installs, and I'll bet there's a few of them in this room, if not more than a few in this room today, are very, very busy. These are the guys I've been telling you about. They're not giving stuff away. In fact, some of them make a point of charging. They, they, take, they take pride, and I'm the most expensive guy in the neighborhood. And people still come to me. Why? Because they do good work, because they have a great reputation, quality versus quantity. Service versus, I, I tried to find another word for not service, but not is kind of it. I mean, we know what some of our large competitors' uh, reputation is in terms of the kind of service that they provide. Okay, We know we do better. Pretty much everybody I talk to, I believe very strongly, and, I, and is, is, is doing an excellent job, and they feel pride in the work that they do. So do we have to compete? And now, recently, we have the do-it-yourself, and then the more even scarier, monitor-it-yourself uh, uh, systems going in. Um, and so now, not only are we competing against uh, alarm companies, big alarm companies that are giving systems away, we're actually competing against people doing it themselves. And unlike the old days where, you know, Radio Shack always had an alarm system you could put in yourself, these are all wireless. I mean, the biggest thing is you got to plug it in. So um, uh, it, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a different market. And the stuff is available at Costco and Lowe's. Uh, central stations, some of them are monitoring for end user and marketing. They actually advertise to monitor uh, end user uh, uh, at lower rate price points. But here again, I come back to that word professional. Is this professional grade? Is what they're offering, what you can get from Costco, professional grade? Is it as good as the security that you provide? And I will tell you, personal opinion, no. Flat no. I don't think it's anywhere close. But you need to pass that word along to the people that you're trying to sell alarm systems to and to the market in general so they know that there are options. They program the equipment, put double stick tape in a box, and send it to you. That's, that's the new alarm system. And then if you have any problems or any questions, they have an 800 number you can call or a YouTube video you can watch that supposedly helps you do it. And it, it's, like, it's like, is that real security? I mean, is that, what, is that what we're doing? But yet, 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 we're, they we're getting to that position where why do I need you as Mr. Professional? I have alarm dealers I, walk, I talk to virtually every week who are installing the stuff they can buy at Costco and Lowe's. They're putting it in on an everyday basis. Oh, how it's so easy. It's so simple. Yeah, you're giving credibility to a product line that essentially the guy can buy retail. 
it's, it's, it's kind of a little scary there. I, I got a little, little story here. I, was, I bought a car about a year ago. And in the process of buying the car, I visited a couple different dealerships. And you know the salesmen there. You get varying levels of salesmen. I had one guy who was actually a pretty good salesman. He started to chat me up a little bit. You know, hey, what do you do? You know, kind of thing. And how's your business? And I talk about being in an alarm business and whatever. Yeah, you know, I bought an alarm system. Uh, you know, guy knocked on our door from Vivant, something like that. You know, yeah, I, I, I know who they are. Yeah, got it, got it. And he goes, he says, he says, yeah, it's kind of expensive. He says, like sixty some bucks a month. And I go, holy cow, that that is a lot. Yeah, you're right. And he says, you know what makes me mad though? And he and he says, I was on the internet. He said, just searching one day, and I happened to see a picture of my keypad. And I go, okay. And he says, I clicked on it. You know, I could have bought the whole thing for 350 bucks myself and put it in and monitored it for like 14. This company was doing it all on the web. I'm paying these guys 65 bucks a month. What just happened there? First off, that guy is going to cancel the minute his contract is up with Vivint. And secondly, he's never going to pay a professional alarm dealer to do an alarm system again. Why? He knows that that professional alarm dealer that he hired the first time used a product that he can get off the shelf at Costco. So why does, he, why does he need him? So are these people selling security? Is low co are the low cost systems designed for, fa these designing for fast installs, pretty, lots of neat features? I mean, is that professional grade security? I mean, I'm not going to tell you it's not, because pretty much everybody and dealer pro uh, dealers out there are doing some of it. I mean, we obviously don't want to do it a lot of times. Some of us do. But is it professional grade security if we do that kind of thing? What does it say to an end user when a professional installs a product that he can buy at the retail store? So are they selling security or are they selling paper? OK? Um, I was an authorized dealer for many years for a major alarm company in the United States I was, uh, for 11 years. I put in 4,500 alarm systems for this company. Okay, over the course of that period of time, you know, they audited my paperwork. Did anybody, how, did they ever audit one of my installations? Not once. Not once in 11 years did anyone ever come out and look at any of the jobs that I put in to see if I did a good job, that I knew what I was doing. But every piece of paper, every piece of paper was audited. I had to actually make a trip one day, 30 minutes there and 30 minutes back to a customer who we had neglected to put the zip code on the paperwork before we submitted it. That's how anal retentive that they were about that paperwork being perfect. They could care less if the installation actually was any good. They only cared that, that paperwork was perfect because they want a paycheck. The goal is the contract. That's what they want. I'm not even sure that they cared as much about the security as, 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 uh, as I did. Some people, signs in the yards and stickers in the window are a security system. But is that professional grade? That's why I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make the point here. You need to see the difference. There is a difference. Differentiation is critical to being successful as an alarm dealer in today's market. You have got to separate yourself from the competition. You don't want to be that guy. You don't want to go and emulate Comcast because they're having success selling thousands. They've got a different business model and a lot more money. So you need to sell the superiority of the alarm systems you install. Years of experience. All of us in this room have years of experience. Some of us decades of experience out there, more and more. Um, association membership, being members of the local or the national associations. To, the, Grant sort of levels of, of, uh, of credibility. Licensing, of course, I think is key in that as well. Um, the quality of what you do from the fact that you put in either a hardwire or a hybrid system. I mean, I, I know our company, we used to do hardwire where we could, wireless where we had to. Wireless wasn't the only thing we did. That wasn't the way we went to market. We put it because hardwire, we felt, and I still feel, is, is, is better if I can do it easily. Um, full protection, protecting the house or the business completely, knowing what are the vulnerabilities, having been around the block to know the kind of, the kind of dangers that some particular uh, business or, or homeowner might face. 
superior service. You can call and get, a, get, a, get somebody on the phone who knows what they're talking about, might be able to even help you over the phone or get back to you right away and definitely get an answer, respond quickly, get there, get there quickly, and of course, professional grade equipment. Being the NAPCO dealer and, the, and talking to, this is not really a NAPCO seminar, but I feel very good about the quality of the product that I, that I sell and the, quality, the quality, product quality that, that you install because we make efforts to make sure that it's professional grade, that it's going to be around for, for decades. It's going to do the job, that you're going to put it in and you're not going to have to go back again. This is the kind of stuff that, that, that a retail grade product doesn't have. They don't really care. You come and buy something at Costco, it doesn't work, what do they do? They give you another one. Uh, they don't care you have to you know, drive an hour back and forth or that it maybe you know, didn't do what it was supposed to do or maybe the next one won't. They, they don't care. They're just selling it. It's, it's another box on the shelf. So let's talk about marketing. All right. So we, we kind of figured out we got differentiation. We've got to separate ourselves. How do we do that? Well, there's a lot of vehicles, a lot of ways to get the word out about your company. Okay. Some work, some don't uh, better than others for certain applications. Sales personnel to me is the number one. Marketing is an umbrella. That's the overarching. Sales is actually a subset of marketing. So sales personnel, in my opinion, are the most important marketing tool that you have. And for many people, you are your salesperson. Okay, so you are a sales personnel. So even though if you don't think, I don't have anybody working for me, sales personnel, you are that person. Second thing is telemarketing. I'm not going to talk much about telemarketing today because it's not really as big as it used to be. I used to do it when I was in business, and it actually worked pretty well. But now with the do not call list, it's very hard to do. Um, if you want to pay a third party company to do telemarketing, uh, you can do it. It actually, surprisingly to a lot of people, works. Uh, it really does. I, I always used to get a lot of comments from people saying, I can't believe you do that telemarketing. I go, I, if people stop buying from me, I'd stop doing it. But they keep buying from me, so I keep doing it. So, it does work, and um, so if you want to get somebody company, it's just very hard to do. If you ever want to do something like that, let me know that I do have some suggestions. Email marketing, I'm going to talk about the goods and the bads of email marketing because I think there are, there are some real pitfalls if you don't do email marketing right, but I think there's some real advantages if you do. Um, advertising, TV, radio, print, on the web, advertising, does that work? How do you do it uh, to be successful? Flyers. This is going to be a big one. You're going to hear me talk about flyers a lot today. Every company should have a flyer designed by you with a little graphics help from somebody who's got some real whiz bang marketing experience or whatever that sells when you're not there. Something you can leave behind with a customer to show hand to a prospect or to hand to somebody you meet that explains what you do and how you do it and the standards that you employ, etc. Flyers that identify you and are your calling card beyond your business card are very important and I'm going to talk about it a bunch. Mail, mail is actually, I would have told you a couple years ago mail is a waste of your time. But now with some of the more targeted things that they're able to do, as well as the fact that now a lot of companies aren't doing mail anymore. It used to be you opened up your mailbox and you got slammed with like 10 different things. Now it's not as, pop, not as popular. So because it's not as popular, maybe you're, you're going to get a little bit more traction than you would otherwise. Um, so that's something to think about. Referrals. We're going to talk a lot about referrals because I think that's a big thing. And signage. I mean, I, I can't tell you I sold a ton of uh, alarm systems because we had the names of our, uh, or the name of our companies on our trucks, but I can tell you that I got several calls over the course of my time in business where people had been following one of our trucks down the road or happened to see something parked somewhere and, and written down the name of the company uh, that they, and, and called us to see if we would uh, you know, come by and talk to them about alarm system. So how do you let the end user know about you? That is, you got to choose the marketing vehicles that you want to uh, want to use. But before you do that, you step back and you say, "Who is it that I want to target?" And it sounds very simplistic. Yeah, you know who it is. Who I want to target? I want to target target people who want to buy my alarm system. That's what I want to target, right? Well, that's this big. That's everybody. That's a shotgun approach. And in the beginning, we all have to do that. Small businesses all have to take whatever you can get in the very beginning. But as time goes on, and as you get better at what you do, and as you get more 
uh, uh, experience in the marketplace, you can narrow your field to get to a target that you're trying to, that you're trying to hit. A target client. Who is that ideal customer for you? Who is the one who's going to actually uh, be the, the guy you really want to do business with? Well, in my opinion, if I was going to ask me right out of the box, the first thing is close to my office. I should own my home. Anything around where I live, I should get, it should be an offense to me when somebody else's sign goes up in my town, right? I want to own my hometown or I own my home area. That is, I want anything's close. Why? Not just because I want to be own my home and whatever, but it's also because it's convenient. Convenient for them, because I can be there in a few minutes to fix a problem. Convenient for me, because I can be there in a few minutes to fix their problem. And, you know, it provide a, a level of service that goes way beyond. A lot of people like uh, dealing with local companies for that reason. Higher end or middle class customer base, the people who can afford to pay for your services. You know, um, you can put a lot of effort into trying to market into, mar into areas where there may be a high demand but not a lot of money. So you need to make sure that you go to an area where people can afford to get what you want or what you're selling. And then, of course, you know, what is your thing? Not everybody, I mean, we're primarily a Berg and Fire Alarm manufacturer in APCO, but access control, closed circuit television, that may be a bigger business to you or, or, or an area maybe that you want to get more business into, that you want to expand into. So, you know, who is that target market? Now, I've done a lot of goal, uh, goal setting courses over the years, and I big, I'm a big believer in goal setting, and I'm not going to talk about that today, but, but I'm going to say one thing about goal setting that I think is important here. This is something that needs to go on a piece of paper. You need to sit down and think about who do I really want to sell to? And you got to put that on a piece of paper. Now, even if that piece of paper goes into a drawer and you never look at it again, the mere act of taking the time to identify the target marketplace that you want to service is going to help you because it will automatically, mentally, start to focus you on how to reach that type of customer. So I'm going to encourage you, and again, there's a lot of stuff, I'm, suggestions and ideas that you're going to get during this presentation. I'm going to encourage you to take the time to do that, to write it down, to figure out who your customers are, and to make that something that's solid in your own mind. Um, because, it, you know, and then, 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 we're going to talk about all the marketing ideas, whatever, today. You can design marketing campaigns to attract that type of client. Okay? So you narrow your focus so that you can then pick and choose the kind of marketing that you need to do to, to, to sell. Um, not all marketing ideas work with all types of people. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about door knocking later. And I can assure you, you cannot door knock successfully in a high income area. You just won't sell anything. I tried. It, it doesn't work. And in fact, most likely the only person you're going to see is the cop because they're going to come, they're going to turn you into the local, uh, local police for, for, for door knocking. So, I mean, realistically, it doesn't work in all areas. So certain vehicles work in some areas, some, some vehicles work in, in, in others, and we'll talk about a little bit of that, that later. Now, when I was putting this together, I, I kind of wanted to talk about niche marketing, and I got to this whole target marketing thing, and I thought, you know, they're kind of the same thing. But then I thought, you know what, they're really not. Because if a target market narrows your focus, the niche market is actually the tip of the spear. That is where your really your laser beam focus is. That's the customer you really want more than anything else. And that's determined by a lot of different things. Um, you can target, uh, say for example, you're, you're big in, oh, a customer I know is big in the healthcare business. Just so happened he had some connections in the healthcare business when he got started. Started doing nurse call systems as a result of that. And over the course of the terms of his business, he's be become fairly much of a specialist in healthcare. And so he's out there focusing his efforts on healthcare. And just guess what? When he happens to be talking to that visiting nurse service uh, about something, uh, the nurse wants an alarm system. Shock of all shocks. Now, oh, and, the, and by the way, yeah, the facility needs a fire alarm and maybe some access control. So all of a sudden, the tip of the spear goes in. I'm looking for this kind of customer. And then all of a sudden, this whole expanded, expanded opportunity of the target market that he's actually going after, the higher end, uh, employed, uh, people who are living, uh, who want certain types of protection, um, all, uh, all comes back to, to help him be successful. 
So the tip of the spear is the niche. Um, and then I'm, ex I'm suggesting, going back to my point about attrition here, right? I am suggesting that then after you, because you're already there, you're in that niche, you're chasing that particular sec sector of the business, look at those companies in that sector of the business that you're chasing who are using your large competitors. Because remember again that whole attrition thing going on? These guys are ticking off customers at all levels. Okay, there, There's a lot of opportunity even with these bigger companies um, and, uh, well, and larger residential applications to, to take that business because these people are smart. They know when they're being taken advantage of. They know when they're not getting good service. And if you're there and you expand your niche to say I'm trying to attract um, all of these uh, 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 you know, people beyond that, you're gonna, it's going to open up additional opportunities. Local, professional service. It should be in your, in your flyer somewhere, your local professional service provider. Some, way, some language that says that. You may be the alternative that they're looking for to that big company experience. OK, so let's start talking about some of those marketing vehicles that we were just uh, listing. First off is advertising. My experience. I'm not going to say this is true for everybody, but my experience and the experience of many of my fellow dealers when I was in the authorized dealer program, many of them will tell you that advertising does not work. Now, honestly, advertising works great. We know it works great. It works awesome. But you have to spend a lot of money, and you've got to do it for a very long time. ADT is probably one of the biggest brand names in our business, in our, in our industry, the worldwide. In fact, recently, you might have heard that when they had this, did this merger, and Protection One is actually going to be running the company, right? But ADT is still the name they're keeping. Why? Because of the brand. Because ADT is spending, uh, last I heard, $50 million a year in advertising, maybe more now. Okay? And they do it every year. It's incessant. It's ongoing. If you're going to do advertising, you've got to do it constantly and repetitively, over and over and over again. If you try Valpac for a couple of months and it doesn't work, you're going to stop doing it. And as a result, the Valpac will never work. If you do Valpac time after time, month after month, year after year, it will work for you. But you have to keep doing it. And it costs a lot of money to keep doing it. And there's not necessarily a good short-term return on investment to pay for it. So advertising is tough. Uh, my ex-wife was actually in the advertising business, and they tell you, you have to just keep going and going and going and going, and, and you just, and over time, people get it. People get it. Eventually, they may have, you may get the phone call. Eventually, you may get the sale. But it takes a while, and it doesn't happen right away. It, 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 phone books, advertising and phone books, I, I, honestly, anymore, I, I'm not going to tell you that they, that they don't work. I, I don't know you don't get an occasional call from them. But I can tell you that all the demographics and, and statistics that I've seen show essentially that phone books are dying. People go to the web to research, uh, but they don't go to the phone book and, and, and look. So your money is best spent elsewhere, in my personal opinion. Again, I may, may be wrong in that. You may have other experiences. <coughs> Unlike advertising, which is more generic as a whole level and covers the whole array of all these things, Local advertising, I think, can be more effective. Again, I'm talking to you about owning your own, your own neighborhoods, owning your hometowns, etc. It's usually fairly inexpensive to run a regular ad in a local newspaper. Now, admittedly, these are not read in depth, these local newspapers and stuff. But it's probably one of the few newspapers that anybody reads anymore because you can't get local news really as conveniently or as easily on the TV or the radio or even on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, on the web. I mean, so local news does, is not as, as easy to get. So local newspapers tend to get a little bit more traction. And they're inexpensive to advertise in. So if you put your name in the tr listing of all the trades or put a little business card ad in, um, it's usually not going to be 25 bucks or something a, a month, and it's something that's reasonably, and that does ultimately, again, it's not going to happen tomorrow. You're not going to get calls immediately the next week. Over time, it will start to pay off. Radio and TV, I had a lot of my counterparts try radio and TV, and I can tell you that in almost every case, they had limited success. Again, the problem here is that you just have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it, and unfortunately, sometimes you're, you can spend a lot of money uh, doing it. If you are going to do it, personalize the content. 
Uh, my, my very best friend, I'm from Washington State originally, my very best friend has a furniture store. And years and years and years ago, he started doing cable TV advertising, and he actually had his family would be actually part of the advertisement. He'd have all his little kids and his wife and everybody. And he kept doing it year after year after year, he still does it today. What's kind of cool about it is that the people of the town that we live in, and it's not a huge area, they saw his kids grow up. Along the way, the kids went from being these little kids, you know, they couldn't hardly sit still to being these more uh, uh, mature teenagers and now adults, and now one of them has actually taken over the, the, the company. And, and it really brings a sense of, you know, personalization to his advertising that has helped his company survive and thrive in a, in a challenging market. He has a lot of competitors that have moved into his marketplace, and he still is doing very well in growing his business because he has developed relationships with people he doesn't know but they, they know him because they've seen his kids grow up on TV. So if you're going to do it, do it, do it something like that. When you're doing your advertising or you're doing your marketing, you want to expose the weaknesses of your competition. Okay? And I know you don't want to necessarily mention names, but you can mention things that they do that may annoy your, uh, uh, your customers or your potential prospects, excuse me. Um, Ask your prospects when you're talking to them to research their competition. Google them. You know, if you Google, I'm not going to use names today, or try, I'm trying not to use names today, but if, I, if you Google one of your, these large companies, just the name of the company, you're going to get pages of all the fluff and stuff and marketing sales stuff. Click here and link and get your own alarm system and yada, yada. And, and they, they swamp the internet with all, the, with all these websites and things. They've developed 10 different websites with different competing uh, web addresses uh, that you think are different, but they're actually the same thing. But now if you take that company name and then you add the word complaints to it and you do a search, now all of a sudden you get a list of all of the, of the uh, people who've, who've complained about that company. And believe it or not, there are not only a lot of people complaining about a lot of these big companies and their practices, there's a lot of people spending time and money bashing them. Long winded, you know, this company did this to me, they did that to me. Uh, there's even examples of people who have actually designed websites just to bash these competitors. So you, you imagine, you tell one of your prospects, hey, you know, don't trust, don't believe me, Google them. But don't Google the name of the company. Google the name of the company plus the word complaints and see what they said. Deceptive business practices. This has been public. I'm not saying anything here that's not new. Several of these companies have been caught in deceptive business practices. They walk in, they say, oh, you don't have to worry about that contract that you have with, uh, with Joe's Alarm Company. Uh, you don't have to really, you don't have to really uh, worry that, uh, uh, about the fact that they have an existing system in here. We're going we're gonna to be fine. You know? no, no big deal. No big deal. Yeah, uh-huh, sure, sure. That, that works real well. Other weaknesses that they have out there? Long contracts. Highlight that. You know, if you don't necessarily have really long-term contracts, highlight the fact that you don't have to sign long-term five, ten-year contracts with you. Slow response. It's one of the biggest. One of the biggest, I call for a service call on my alarm system. Uh, well, we'll be able to get there in two weeks. Uh, okay, you know, I, so does that mean I'm not going to pay you for the next two weeks? Is that, is that you're going to give me a refund for the time that my alarm system isn't working? Um, incompetent, rude personnel. I mean, the truth is, is that when you deal with these big companies, you oftentimes get people who've been there 30 years, who are rock solid, know their stuff, you know, the, the, the guy that you would definitely want to be take care of you. It's definitely possible because there are, there are those people. But it's just as likely or maybe more likely that you're going to get the guy who just fell off the turnip truck, who just finished training and doesn't really know enough about it to be dangerous, but then, you know, you catch him and oh, is that what you meant to say? Yeah, that's exactly what I meant to say. Uh, well, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, then well, it's because it's your problem, you know, and whatever. Anyway, all these kind of issues. You, that, that all of a sudden the guy says, whoa, you know, I, I thought you, I was the customer here. And, uh, you know, they don't get a proper, uh, a proper uh, relationship with the company. They don't feel like they, they really care. And um, as a result, there's an opportunity. I've always said, for example, and being, doing what I do, selling alarms, alarm equipment, that I cannot be everybody's number one alarm company, alarm manufacturer. There are some in this room who I know use, 
a really sad story, but they use other things besides NAPCO. And, and when uh, I talk to them, I, I say to them a lot, I say, look, you know, I realize I can't be number one, but I definitely want to be number two so that maybe you'll use some of my stuff along the way. And when number one screws up, guess who you're going to? Number two, right? Because he was there. You're there to answer when, when the other guys weren't. I actually had dinner last night with one of those guys who, who I've known for a very long time, and, and he's using one of my competitors, and I just happened to ask him, so when was the last time DSC took you to dinner? Uh, he couldn't come up with a time, so I don't think they really ever did. So I, my, point, my point wasn't anything. That, it was just the fact that, that if you are there occasionally, that means something, and you stay in touch. That's, that's what marketing is all about. When you're marketing, always have a special offer. Always. Always, always, always. I can't emphasize this enough. You, every single time that you do any kind of marketing, anything, it has to have a special offer. If you go out there and you say, hey, I got a great company, that's name recognition. Awesome. Long term may mean something. You have a special offer, they might call. Okay? You want them to call. You want them to think about what they, why they want to, why they want to come and talk to you. So, even if that special isn't that really that special to you, it can still be special to them. Um, I used to say, for example, that our system is normally $1,200, but I'll do it for $799. That $99, believe it or not, matters. If you think you say $800, it means the same. It doesn't. $799 is a big difference. Really, big difference. Uh, free equipment. We sell uh, smoke detectors, right? Well, you know, some of our smoke detectors actually include heat detectors. Well, Mr. Jones, if, if you buy from me today, I'll include a heat sensor in your system as well. How much does that extra heat sensor cost you? A buck, maybe two bucks difference between the one that doesn't have the heat sensor? The basement, I used to love this one. If I go into a house, they have an open basement, right? I can run a motion detector, what cost me about 15 bucks, right? In a five, five foot piece of wire from where the alarm control panel's done. And I've just given that guy $175 value. Honestly, these little things help. I mean, NAPCO makes a, a motion detector called the 1680PT that has a built-in uh, 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 heat, uh, heat sensor thermostat so that you can actually use it for alarm, for a, for a temperature alarm, high or low temperature. Mr. Jones, in order to help make this, make this decision easier for today, I'm going to throw a heat sensor into your system that will let you know if this house either gets too hot or too cold. Is that good enough? These little things matter. They matter because people are looking for that extra thing. They want something special. They want something special. My girlfriend goes to Marshall all the time. She doesn't buy anything anywhere else. Why? Everything's always special at Marshall's. <laughs> always. Free service. Three months free monitoring. I have guys who do that. Another guy told me the other day that he, he uses six months free monitoring instead of other things. Whatever works for you, always have a special offer. Okay. So. We need to generate leads. That's what this is all about. Marketing is all about generating leads, okay? Creating um, a, a, a list of names or people who will call us. So how do you get the names to sell, okay? Um, most dealers I know survive on referrals, okay? In fact, I would tell you that, that six out of 10 dealers that I talk to and I ask what they do for marketing, they say, my phone rings. <laughs> I don't have to market, I, I'm, I'm busy. Okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to disagree with you, okay. Uh, but what do you do when the referrals aren't enough? What did you do in 2008 when all of a sudden people stopped referring people because there were, even though you had a good existing customer base, there wasn't as much new, 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 new customers going on and a lot of people weren't doing anything. What if you really want to grow your company as opposed to just keep it where it is? If you want to build, I think it's the smartest move because in my opinion, if you are not growing, you are declining. Doesn't mean you can't stay stable, it just means it goes like this, okay? If you are growing, then typically you're not declining. If you're not growing, typically you are. Um, so I think one of the most important messages that I can pass along to you today is to ask for referrals. Ask for referrals. When you complete a sale, you finish the sale, is there anyone else that I can help that you, that you might know, okay? If you answer the question and you say, 
uh, well, you know, I, I, well, you just finished the sale. Why don't you put the system in first, and then we'll see, right? Uh, I'll, then I'll see the kind of work you do, and I'll may, I maybe want to give you a name or two. So, okay, you've already set the stage, right? So now I come back. I finished the job. I did a good job. So uh, do you, is there anybody else that you might know? There you go. You've already, you're already there. And then keep going. When you stop by for a service call, you say, hey, look, by the way, while I'm in the neighborhood, is there anybody else who you think might want to get an alarm system? Ask for referrals. You must ask, but I can assure you that in reality, the vast majority of folks don't ask. And I, I don't really get it, but I kind of get it because it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit sticking your neck out, asking for something special. It sales ask for, you have to ask for the order in sales. So lead generation requires asking for referrals. Uh, I, I actually sat through a seminar where the guy who had been a very successful salesman, uh, made a big presentation about how you should ask for 10 referrals on every sale you go into. I was never able to get 10. I never even tried to get 10. I was happy to get two or three. I mean, more than one was awesome for me. But I mean, he, was, he would push, you can get 10. I got 10 all the time. You know, go for it if you don't ask. And I think it's a valid point. I think there's some point at which you feel comfortable, which you, which you don't. And I, I don't want to get the guy, you know, get your address book out. Let's get going, you know. Let's start writing down all the names in there. It, it, it depends on what you're comfortable with. But you've got to ask for referrals. Question, are you, are you proud of the work you do? If you're proud of the work you do, then, and you do it better than the big guys, which, again, I pretty much assume we all do it better than the big guys, then ask for names. Why? Why? You're doing, you're doing them a favor. You're, get, you're getting them away from these other companies. And again, always offer an incentive, not only to the, to the new customer, but also to the person who's giving you the referral. I found the number 100 bucks had a lot of impact. I talked to a guy who done, he's, does, he's offered 50. He doesn't get as much response out of it. I said, look, you know, try 100. I know it's a little bit more, but the fact is that 100 bucks means something to people. That's, you can do something with 100 bucks. And so, uh, so, yeah, you give me a new customer and you get a new three-year contract out of somebody, uh, you know, 100 bucks is not a big investment to get a new customer that you didn't have to spend marketing money to get, right? And don't be afraid. They can only say no, but they, can, they also can say yes. And again, this is Dwayne's opinion. I think you can get an extra sale out of almost every sale you do by asking for referrals. And even if you don't get any from one, maybe you'll get two from another. But you've got to ask. Okay, so let's talk about sales personnel. And you heard me already mention the fact that sales personnel include you. You are a salesperson. Um, but when you're trying to hire new people, right, hiring and firing is one of the hardest things that you can do. It really is. I mean, it, it, it can make or break you. You can spend a fortune, even if you don't offer a lot, the guy a lot of money, you can spend a fortune training, and then he can go out and see your customers or, or, or represent your company poorly. So you can be, you've got to be very careful. You can waste a lot of time while he's home watching TV, and you're supposed to be paying him. So the cost of hiring wrong is immense. The best sales representatives are not always those that you would expect. In fact, we used to try to actually, if we had trouble advertising for, or getting salespeople, we would actually advertise for technicians and then tell them that the technical spot was filled. We have sales opportunities, though. Or we'd bring them in as a technician for service work and say, look, I don't have enough work to keep you busy all the time. Do you want to make some extra money selling alarms? And we can teach you how to do that. Because oftentimes, the technical guys are as good or better than some of these real sales guys at selling, at selling alarm systems. Um, there is a tool called personality profiles um, that, that can be used. Uh, they are, it's kind of expensive. I've, I've, you've probably done a couple of them yourself where they, they have different sectors of your personality. You look for the certain kind of person that, that would fit this gap. I, I don't necessarily know if it's worth the money to do it, but the concept is valid. There are certain kinds of personalities that are more successful at sales. The people who aren't as shy, a little bit more outgoing, um, the people who are, are maybe a little bit more uh, uh, courageous, uh, more confident in themselves uh, than others. So you, you, it's probably important to do a little research here to find the kinds of personalities that you're looking to get. Uh, but but hiring, hiring salespeople is a, is a challenge, but doing it right is important. Um, and if you've made a mistake, don't wait. Okay, get rid of the mistake as soon as possible or the person because they're not going to help you. They're going to cost you. They're going to continuously cost you more and more money. It is also key to understand what motivates them. 
Now, everybody seems to think that money is the only thing that matters to a salesman. And I would tell you, money is probably the only reason that most of us get up and go to work in the morning. Whether you're a salesman or you're not a salesman, right? That's what we do it for. So, yes, money is important. It's absolutely true. Money is important. But there's a lot of other things that are important as well. And if you're going to get the maximum benefit out of having that salesperson, you should look at what else motivates them. Um, respect. A lot of salespeople, they want to be respected. They want you to appreciate that they, that, what they're doing, and you want to respect the, the, the work that they're trying to do for you and your company. Loyalty. I mean, honestly, that's a hard thing nowadays. If you get somebody who stays with you for any period of time and has, and has, has shown this co your company loyalty, you should acknowledge that. And you should, and you, because that's important to them. They want to know. They want. They want to know that you appreciate the fact that they're sticking with you. Okay, recognition. This is a big deal. Recognition is a big deal. You should recognize those people who are very, who are, who are very uh, successful for you. It all, not only motivates them, but it motivates the people around them. I used to have a sales rep, uh, my number one sales guy, who did 30 systems a month. Okay, on an average day, he would, he would do, he would write 30 deals a month for me. One month he did 40. I walked in, I handed him a couple hundred bucks, and I said, go take your, take your girlfriend out to dinner, have a great one, congratulations on an awesome month. You could, I mean, his face turned red, you, he was so proud of himself, you could, you, and the whole room, everybody was like, rah, 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 rah. You know, but he was, he was, he was, he did a great job for me. And I wanted to let not only him know, but everybody else know. Recognition is, is a big deal. Spiritual. A lot of people are very religious. And they don't necessarily need to believe that you agree with them, but they want to know that you respect their faith and that that's, you know that that's important to them. A lot of people, it's a big deal. And so, you know, show that respect for, the, for who they are and, show that, show, and, and be tolerant of their, of their having to go to certain, uh, maybe take time off to go to certain holidays or things like that because it's an important piece of, piece of their lives. And a lot of people, it's, it's more important than a lot of other things that they do. And then purpose. And this is probably the thing that I could tell you motivates me more than anything else. I've been doing this, like I told you, for a long time. And one of the things that, I, that gets me up in the morning and gets me going is I feel like I'm really doing a good job. I think I'm doing something that's helpful, that's useful. I know, I know, as an alarm dealer, that I save people's homes from burning down. I know at least two homes I save from burning down. I can tell you we caught some, caught some burglars that are now in jail, or at least were in jail last time I checked. Because they, were, because they tried to defeat our alarm systems, okay? And I can also tell you that I know that my system has deterred home invasions. People, guy, one guy called me up one day, and he was mad at me because he didn't, he didn't realize he could set his system for instant. Somebody had gone into his house while his home family was sleeping, and instead of going off immediately, it started beeping, giving him the entrance delay, right? So I know I have helped people, and I've actually been on the other side of that. We've all been on the other side of that, right? The, probably the whole, most horrible story that ever happened to me was a guy who I went into after he had a home invasion. They actually got him and his wife out of bed, tied him to a chair, wrapped him up in duct tape, and then tried to get the money. The guy was, a, was silly, and I'll be nice. He, he let people know he didn't really believe in banks. Well, if you don't keep your money in your bank, where do you keep it, right? So these guys figured it out, came to his house in the middle of the night, like I said, pulled him and his wife out of bed. He wouldn't tell them anything. I'm not, not going to tell you. Kill me. Go ahead. And, but then they took his kid out of bed, and they stabbed him in front of him. They didn't hurt him. Thank God he was okay. He's, he's okay. But you want to talk about a motivated buyer? I mean, they, they got his money. They got his money, whatever he, whatever he had there. But he, whatever it costs, you put it in, and I want it in today. You know, so we've been there. We've all had these kind of stories where we've, where we've protected people. So for me, purpose, that, that I have a real value that I am providing to people, I am doing something good, I am helping protect their families and, their, and, I'm tell, and, and from them from, from, uh, from bad things that might happen. Okay, I'm going to give you a few techniques. So we've talked already about a couple things. You need to always offer a, offer a special and you need to ask for referrals. This is a technique that you can do right now, tomorrow, and start making more money and more sales. Okay. Cloverleafing is essentially walking around the neighborhood where you are putting in a system already. Now, my problem was most of my people worked in the evenings, uh, salespeople. They worked afternoons and evenings because that's when most people were available to meet. And so 
this requires them getting up in the morning and going to the job start. Because you want to be there to introduce your technician and then to walk around the neighborhood. Again, passing out business cards and flyers to people in the neighborhood. Say, look, you might be hearing some sirens later on today. I just want to let you know that, that's, that we're just putting an alarm system. Nothing's going wrong here. And if, by the way, if you ever need anything, give me a call. No, no sales pitch. No sales pitch. Just here. You know, here's my name. The interesting thing about that is you're doing it as a favor. You're doing it to, save, to, to make sure that they don't get upset if they hear sirens or whatever, worry that something's happening. And you're just dropping off flyers. You're not really selling them anything. Um, and, and, and I will tell you guys, it works. It works. Clover leafing was one of the most effective techniques I ever did. And I'm not talking about door knocking huge areas of a town or anything. I'm talking about walking around the neighborhood. You know, walking up and down this street or that street that's close to the area, we're putting an alarm system here and there. Not that far, not that much time, a half hour. Drop off flyers, believe it or not, our record was if I ever got people to do it, <laughs> they would almost always get another sale. Almost always. Why is that? Why do you think it is that? It's because others may be interested in the area and usually are. There's a reason why you're there visiting Mrs. Jones today. There was a burglary down the street. Or maybe they got a warning from the local police that there was a rash of burglaries in the area. Or maybe there was a big fire down the block or a carbon monoxide poisoning or whatever it is. There was a reason why that homeowner or that business people, those business people decided to put in an alarm system. And, and usually there's a reason why their neighbors are interested as well. And how horrible is it that you put in an alarm system in this house and the next day uh, you, know, you see a Sloman sign in this house? Nothing against Solomon's. I'm, you know, got, the fact is the people are that they're marketing out there too. So we got to make sure to let people know what we do, okay? And we need to pass out the word locally. And I can tell you, if you'll do this tomorrow, starting tomorrow with all your job starts, you'll see your business grow. Okay, so let's talk about door knocking. Door knocking has a bad reputation, and in many ways justifiably so. There's been a lot of abuse of door knocking, and as a result, there's a lot of people who say, I would never do it and don't want to do it, and et cetera. And there are some laws pertaining to door knocking. There are some areas that you have to have permits. A lot of areas you have to have permits. But again, we're talking target marketing, right? So assuming that your town is XYZ right here, and you've got a surrounding number of maybe four or five towns that are, that are within your, your little uh, area that you want to own, why not have permits in those areas? And when you have a little extra free time or your salesman has a little extra free time, why not walk around those areas? And if you don't want to knock on doors, drop off flyers. But I would suggest door knocking because it's not that bad. Now, I say it's not that bad because I did it and it wasn't so bad. Some people didn't like it at all. Because it does require an ability to take a little rejection. You know, maybe more than a little rejection. You get a lot of rejection sometimes. So, it, but it works. It works. I, I, we wrote probably 1,000 deals from door knocking, at least. At least. Um, one time we sold 12 systems in one night walking through a neighborhood. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that you can do just by getting out and making it happen. Vivint, that company that, that just sold for $2 billion a couple years ago, that's how they go to market. They go out to Utah and they hire uh, a bunch of folks who, uh, from the colleges out there who aren't afraid to door knock, you know, and they take those people, they go into certain areas around the country and they write thousands of alarm systems in a, in a, in a, in a couple of months during the summer. They do it, they've been doing it for years and years and as a result their company is worth $2 billion when they, went, when they sold a few years ago. And they didn't even have anywhere near the number of accounts to justify that number. It's just they had a business model that worked and an, av and a and an average recurring revenue that was way above everybody else. If you're going to do it, note that 1 in 50 will buy. So that means you're going to knock on 50 doors, 49 doors, before you get to that 50th. On the average, I have actually done it myself, so I can tell you there's sometimes I get out of the car, walk up to the first house, and bam, I walk in the door. There are times when I go days and I don't get in the door. So it's, it's one of those things, just like anything else, it's random. It's a numbers game. You keep doing it, it works. One in 50 will buy is the, is the typical number. And so every time, you, if, every time if you're, uh, in my case, uh, we were paying $200 for a basic alarm system we sold. And so uh, I taught my guys that every time you knock on a door, it's, cost, it's four bucks. 
there's four bucks, go to the next door, there's another four bucks, another next door, another four bucks, and all of a sudden, bam, you get the payout. There's 200 bucks. And so uh, all those other doors are just equaling what you're getting from that one. If you're going to do it, use a script. The script we use had a kind of an interesting front end that I like to, I like to uh, portray because it had a couple of valid points in there. What is, if I ask you, Stan, if I say, Stan, are you interested in the alarm system? What's the answer? No. The answer, are you interested, is always no. Always no. They're never going to say, it's just, it's just, it's almost an habitual response. No, I'm not interested. Whatever it is you want to sell me, I'm not interested, okay? But, excuse me, I have a small problem, and I thought you could help me with it. You can't say no to that, right? There's like a no, I say, no, I don't want to help you. You're a jerk. I don't want to help you. No, no, no. But it's, it's a way to get the door. You know, I, I was in the neighborhood. I was, I was hoping maybe that I could, uh, I could, uh, talk to you about an alarm system or whatever happens to be the rest of it for you. But the point is is that you don't want to be offensive. You want to be just say, hey, I'm here to, I'm here to, uh, to see if you're interested, but I don't want to use that word, are you interested. I'm, I just, that's all I want. I want. And I'll believe it or not, it works, okay? If you do door knocking, one of the things I'm going to encourage you to do is call me because I did it for a lot. I can give you a lot of information uh, on how to do it, how to recruit to do it, how to train to do it. And, and, um, and, and like I say, it, it can be helpful. Um, if you're doing strategy, the way to do it is you pick a high crime area, and then you get a map. I know those are kind of hard to find anymore, but you get an actual map, and you put a red dot at the high crime area, and then you draw concentric circles around that. Your demand goes up as you, as you, get, as you get closer to the high crime area, but your money goes up typically as you get further away. So there's a balance between you know, getting somebody who's in a, a demand, at the same time you're getting someone who, is, uh, uh, who has the money to buy an alarm system uh, or the uh, desire to buy an alarm system. So uh, you, you work those marketplaces that are close to the high crime areas um, and uh, not in the high income areas. Because like I said, high income areas don't work. You can, if you're going to do high income areas, Drop off flyers in those areas, not in the mailbox. I got in trouble for that once. I ended up going home one day and getting a stack of, stack of all of the things that I had spread out there in the mail saying, if you do it again, we're going we're gonna to report you. So you, can't, you cannot put it in the mailbox. You can put it near the mailbox. You can put it uh, on the, on the, by the, where the flag is. You can put it in the, uh, in the newspaper uh, holder, but you can't put it in the mailbox. Um, again, Always have a special deal. Always have a special deal, or you're never going to get the sale. And then this is one of my favorite lines, and it applies to sales as well as lead generation. applies to everything in life. A lot of times it applies to relationships with women, I know. Um, some will, some won't. So what next? That is how to deal with rejection. Some will, some won't. So what next? Okay. You're not going to win them all. You'll never win them all. You'll never lose them all. Some will, some won't. Okay? Keep on going. If you decide that maybe you don't want to do door knocking, residential door knocking, you can do commercial canvassing. And I actually had some fairly decent success at commercial canvassing as well. Walking around commercial areas, passing out at, uh, uh, flyers and, and business cards, and um, uh, and you know, just basically letting people know what I do. Um, so as you walk around these commercial areas, um, get the names of decision makers and phone numbers of of people uh, in the area that are uh, uh, that you're seeing and visiting. So it, this is not going to be something you're going to walk in and make a sale. Commercial canvassing is not walking in the door and making a sale. It's walking in the door, introducing yourself, getting the name and address and phone number of the uh, of the decision makers and saying, look, I'll call back to set an appointment. It doesn't hurt to do this. And it's, it's silly that a lot of people just don't do it. But you've got to let people know what you're doing. Um, and when you're there or when you're calling back or when you're going back for the third or the fourth time to try to get in the door, present all of your services. Make sure they know everything that you do. Um, obviously, intrusion is, a, is an opportunity all the time but maybe a special monitoring rate is, is, would be interesting to them. Uh, fire is huge in New Jersey because of the windowless basement um, uh, rules that are, that are being enforced in a lot of jurisdictions. CCTV is always big. 
you never know what it is that's going to cause them to be interested in what in uh, in you and, and open the door for you and let you have a chance. Okay. One of the things that I'm going to pass along to you today is that you have to be on the internet. You have to have a website, and you should have a good website. There are no more phone books. I remember we were paying thousands of bucks a month, thousands of dollars a month to be in phone books here and there and everywhere in our target marketplace, right? To, and, and yet, so many dealers today don't spend anything on the internet. That is the phone book of today. If I'm going to be looking for an alarm system, the first place I'm going is to the web. And, what, and who do you see immediately when you click on the web is all the big companies. They dominate the web because they're spending money. They're spending three, four dollars a click just to get you to just to get you, you you to click on theirs and look at their at their website. But you can do it. You don't have to pay three to four dollars a click. You can actually be listed and you can get you can get your company up there without trying to compete with those big guys just by focusing on some on some things that that experts in this particular business know how to do. Um, sometimes when their people are hitting the web, they actually buy on the web. A lot of times though, and I think uh, uh, the statistics bear me out on this, I, at least the ones I've read, that more often they actually will research and then they will either go somewhere or they'll call somebody. They don't necessarily buy. A lot of people are buying and more are buying all the time, but now a lot of people are still, are still calling. And when you get a real website, I'm going to use the same logic I'm giving to you about your businesses today. Get a real website. You can do it yourself, just like your customer can do his own alarm system. And you're going to get the same quality that you get out of that alarm system. You know, I, you can do it a lot better by getting a professional whose job is to do this and his job is to maintain it and whose job is to make sure that you get as high a exposure as you possibly can. And believe me, you've got to be here. If you're not here, you have a one or two page website right now, you are losing business because of that. I, 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 I can absolutely guarantee it. Create a database, okay? As you're walking around neighborhoods or commercial areas mostly particularly, everybody you ever talk to should be on your database. Everybody. All of the people that used to be your customers, everybody who canceled should be on that database. All obviously, obviously all your current customers should be on that database. Any prospect that you've ever visited who didn't buy from you should be on your database. Anybody you met at a home show should be in your database. Um, you can use ACT, which is my favorite. Of course, NAPCO doesn't use ACT anymore. We use something else. We use a web-based database, which is convenient, but I like ACT because it's easier to do searches and such. Uh, but you can use any other commercial database. Um, and then regularly, either mail or email to that database. And I say regularly. I don't mean you have to do it every day. I think, in fact, I think that's wrong. I think it's a bad thing to do it every day. We'll talk about email marketing in a minute. Uh, but mail regularly. Stay in touch with the people on your database. Uh, because even if you don't win their business the first time, maybe you're there, you didn't get, you didn't get that account, you didn't, they, they went somewhere else. But now all of a sudden you're on their database and every few months they get a little email from you and you get a little security tip, you know, about, oh, by the way, make sure you do this or be aware there's been a rash of burglaries in this area or whatever. And over time, assuming that they don't, you know, shut you off and say, I don't want your, 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 your emails anymore, you become their security consultant. And then you're number two when number one screws up or at the end of the agreement. Okay, so get that database and put them in there and everybody you ever know, any name you can find, put on that list and try to keep it up to date. This is almost as valuable as the rest of your company because staying in touch with all those people and having that na those names and an active list of, of names, I mean there are people sending me ads or all the time, every day almost I get people trying to sell me lists. This is your list. This is your personal list. And, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's more meaningful than getting a list that, from, that you buy from anybody else. In fact, my thinking is if I'm going to do email marketing today, I'm doing it myself. I'm not going to pay a company and buy a list and mail it to a bunch of folks who don't know me because honestly, personally, I don't like it when I get a bunch of email from people I don't know. And then they act like they know me. Hey, oh, you ignored my last email. Of course I did. I don't know you. I have no clue who you are. Why would I, wanna, why would I not uh, respond to it, right? 
So, but but if if you visited with me at one time and I know what you look like and 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 we've talked and all of a sudden you know I and I'm, it doesn't offend me that you send me a note every now and then, then you know why not? Why wouldn't I listen? I like the idea of it about once a quarter. I don't think it's that big of a deal to to send out a note once a quarter, um, and do it until they tell you to stop. When they tell you to stop, personal opinion here. Tell you when they tell you to stop, send them a nice little note saying. Mr. Jones, thank you very much for, for taking my emails for all these years. I appreciate the fact that you've listened to me when I've had the chance. I am taking your name off the database, and you will not get anything more from me. Please contact me if I can ever be of assistance again. Okay? I've actually had people say, you know what? Don't take me off your mailing list. Because I actually took the time to confirm that I'm actually doing what they asked me to do, and I was nice about it. Yeah, you know what? I don't mind. Send me a note every now and then. I mean, not often, honestly. Most of the time, they want me off the list. But still, every once in a while. Um, again, always, you're going to hear this, this is a mantra, always have a deal, security tip, warning, don't send out the same thing all the time. If you send out the same thing all the time, they're not going to read it. They'll realize, oh, it's the same stuff I've been getting. Uh, it's not. So make it unique. Do something different. If you get the magazines, the national magazines, they all have security tips and ideas and things happening. You talk about identity theft. Stuff that doesn't necessarily doesn't apply to you, but maybe applies to them. And, and you can become their security professional consultant. Include a photo if you dare. Okay? I think the idea of personalization, making it personal so it comes from you. When I sent out my email for this class, I wrote a letter saying, look, I wrote this class. I think it's got some important things to say. If you have the time, come and listen. That's what, I was, that's what I'm saying. It came from Dwayne. Okay, so people, a couple people in the room, maybe, you know, hey, you know, Dwayne's in town, maybe I'll stop by and, and hear what he has to say. You know, he took time to put this together. Maybe it's, uh, there's something of value. Personalize it makes it special. E-commerce. Okay, so e-commerce is one of those things that's kind of on the edge. Do we really want to do e-commerce? I think we should. And, and I'm not saying we sell our alarm systems via e-commerce. But let's sell some stuff. I remember when I was uh, when I was doing it, we used to have those you know those hoods that you put to put over your head when you were if you got stuck in a fire and had to get out through the smoke, right? We used to oh, those hoods. We sold fire ladders, you know, things like that that people don't always buy for themselves and don't maybe think about. I actually had a lot of people who I mentioned when I was there because I, I did a lot of fire and I mentioned to people, you know, you should have a fire ladder. Well, do you sell them? I started selling fire ladders because people never had them, and they never. They, well, you can get them at Home Depot, but you know that's basically where I got them. You know, I turn around and I'd sell them. I and um, I actually came up with a couple of unique products, and we didn't sell a ton of it. We had a little bit of it. And you know what? E-commerce is growing at such a pace that who knows? Maybe you'll find a little product that all of a sudden a niche product that people will buy, and all of a sudden you'll get an extra source of income, and you know, ten thousand bucks a year, whatever, is all of a sudden pops into your head. It's not not nothing to sneeze at, you know. Um, when you do your sales pitch for whatever you're trying to sell on the web or in your flyer, it's absolutely true, the same thing is true, highlight your entire sales pitch. Just as if you're in the room talking to me, give me that, those, those most important bullet points that, that are going to convince the, the, uh, the end user that you're, you're the guy that they should, should want to choose for uh, that service and, that's, and their system. Um, make it an extension of you. Okay, I really believe that that's, that's the key to successful marketing um, for what, what we're trying to sell. Okay, let's talk about electronic communications for a minute. So when we get phone calls, when we get you know, emails, uh, how do we normally react to them? Believe, me, believe it or not, when um, I hire people, and one of, one of my reps uh, actually asked me during the interview, what's the most important thing that I can do to help you be successful? I mean, I love that line. That's great. I'm saying, I, I want more salespeople who ask that question, right? And you know what I told them? I said, answer the phone and return phone calls promptly. I, I, went, to, I went to a distributor down in D.C. about a, six months to a year after I started with NAPCO. And, and as I'm walking out the door, I did my little counter day thing, you know, as I'm walking out the door, uh, one of the guys says, oh, yeah, by the way, thanks for returning our calls. And I go, I, <laughs> really? I mean, that's, that's the job, right? You turn on our He says, you would be surprised. And I can see the people nodding in the room. How many times have you called vendors on my side of the table who just don't get back to you? I mean, so... 
what do you think your customers think if you know they leave you a message and they don't hear from you for three or four days? So first off, shock the heck out of them by answering the phone. You know how many people are like, oh, I didn't expect you to answer the phone. It's like, oh, you know, I, I thought I was getting voicemail. You know, you answer the phone. It's like, wow. And and then if you get back to them promptly, it's it's very important. So answer your phone, return calls quickly, and texts. Believe it or not, are often welcomed and people like them. So I mean, I don't know if you need to ask permission or whatever, but sometimes people prefer to deal with texts. I had some customers when I was on your side of the table. I, I had one in particular who was a really big account. I had eight different locations with that guy. And uh, I couldn't get him to answer my phone calls. But if I send him a text, boom. <laughs> you know, I get an answer within five minutes. So we just never talked. We just always texted. And it just depends on, on the application. Email is absolutely essential. And of course, I'm going to give you a little hint here. If you have a good website, your email address should have your website address as the end, at alarmcompany.com. Not at Yahoo, not at, Google, at, at Gmail, at youralarmcompany.com. Real companies have websites. You heard me say that earlier. You need to have a website and you need to have an email address that references your website because who has a Yahoo account, right? I mean, if you're a, if you're a professional. I'm not saying that it's not an OK thing. A lot of guys do it and it's fine, whatever. I'm just telling you how I think it would be done better and how I think it would be more successful. And I believe this to be true. And when you're communicating, again, always have literature, special offers, security tips, warnings, etc. Okay, your own voicemail, right? When you call in, leave a message. Some people don't leave messages. They, they call and then they, they oh, I didn't get through to him, I won't leave a message. I'm in sales. I can assure you it's best always to leave a message. A short message. Doesn't want, you don't want a long message unless you're answering a question that they've called you about or something. Short message, this is Dwayne. I'm just calling you back. Uh, call me when you get a chance at this number, yada, yada, yada. I'm going to be in a meeting for the next couple hours. Call me after this time, whatever it is. Always leave a phone number because sometimes people don't have caller ID or it's not convenient to have your, to have your, to just call you back. So always leave a phone number. And on your voicemail message, I've heard a lot of different voicemail messages over the year. One of the biggest things that, 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 that happens is that you get this long-winded thing going on. You try to keep it as brief as possible. Um, and make it clear. And I like to end with a slogan or, or, or have a slogan somewhere in it. So I always put at the end, you know, have a great day. I've been doing it for forever. It's always have a great day at the end. But if you're religious, maybe have a blessed day. Um, I've had guys who say, um, I can't take the call right now. I'm out protecting uh, people in the, in the community. Uh, so uh, please leave a message. I, I mean, the, whatever it is, people like the little tricky things. I mean, it's little teeny thing that, that, that matters. It matters. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about if you're selling stuff, you know, I mean, always have a special offer and all these things. And I want you to think about all the stuff you sell that you really want to sell, okay? Because we may have all done things that maybe we didn't really want to do because we needed the work at the time. But the stuff that you really want to sell, if you sell it, promote it. You know, let people know you do it. One of the most annoying things that ever happened to me as an alarm dealer was walking into an auto body shop that I did business with. I put a nice camera system in his place. And actually, I did business meeting. I actually took my cars to him. He actually did a bo uh, body work as well as some repair work on my vehicles, right? And I walk in there one day, and I'm talking to the guy. I turn around, and there's a Slowman's keypad on the, on the wall. And I go, what did you do? You know? <laughs> oh, I didn't know you did burglar alarms. I thought you did camera systems. I'm sorry. I would have chosen you if I would have known. Who was at fault there? Me. I should have known that I have to let everybody know what I do. I, my fault I lost that account. Have you ever had a neighbor buy a professional alarm system from somebody else? How annoying is that to see a neighbor put another competitor's sign in? Say, did you see that truck in the yard there? I, I, do the, I do this is what I do for a living. You let people know what you do. If you sell it, promote it. And also talk about all the applications you service. Believe it or not, even though my company was mostly residential, I did a lot of commercial. The two largest commercial companies in my county were my customers. But everybody thought I did residential, and so I lost a lot of business because people thought that I didn't do commercial. 
because I was a residential company. So let them know that you do commercial or you could do industrial. Let them know the applications if you're a healthcare uh, specialist or, or you do uh, retail stores or think whatever that kind of stuff is. Let them know what you do because these specialties are oftentimes, oh, I, got, I want somebody who's, who knows my business, okay, when it comes to retail or when it comes to healthcare or whatever it happens to be. Okay, so when you're selling, one of the things that you definitely want to do when you're in front of a customer is you want to be as, as much yourself as possible. You want to be authentic. I love that term. It came out of this last election. We've got a lot of authentic this time. I'm not sure how good authentic's been, but we have it. So you don't necessarily want to be the smooth talker. A lot of people are afraid of sales or think they're not good salesmen because they're not smooth talkers. You know, they're not the, they're not the real uh, uh, e polished, good word, yeah, good polished guys. I think it's actually a negative, to be honest with you, if you're too polished. Because now all of a sudden, the first thing I'm thinking is, you want me to buy something. You want me to, you're going to sell me. That's what you're here for. And people don't like to be sold. They don't like you to sell stuff to them. They like to buy. Right? They, like to, they don't like to be sold. They don't like to be manipulated. And they think somebody who uh, is polished, is a good, great word, I'm going to use that from now on, is, uh, is, uh, is, is going to try to get, a, get something over on them. So being yourself, being confident, being knowledgeable about what you do, expressing it in your own way, in your own words, is awesome. That's really the best way to do it. And it's better, believe it or not, if the customer thinks they're smarter than you. I mean, and honestly, honestly, they are smarter than you. They know what they need, you don't. You maybe know your business, but you don't necessarily know their concerns and their worries. They have to teach you and tell you what you need. So, so properly, show proper deference to the people who actually you're trying to sell to. And, and, and look, hey, you teach me. You let me know what you, what you want. I think it's better to do it that way. Show you care and be aware of buying signals. If you, ta if you say to me, you know, that sounds good. We're done. <laughs> I'm done. I don't care if I just started my sales presentation. You say, yeah, that sounds good. OK, let's start writing it up right now, boy. We're done. There's so many people who get the buying signal, and then they say, uh, keep on going. And it's like you talk yourself out of the sale. By, by keep going. You know, the guy wants to buy, so let him buy. Get out of his way. Thank you very much. Let's, let's go, you know. Uh, so be, be aware of buying signals. Do not oversell. That's one of the biggest problems that I've seen with, with, with sales reps is that, they, is that they, they just can't shut up. They love to hear themselves talk. And I would rather hear the customer talk because the, the customer uh, is going to tell me what they want. And again, be yourself. Okay, setting appointments. In my opinion, setting appointments is a sale. So I use this, this, this thing as is what's more valuable, time or money? Anyway, I think most people would say time. I know, I know that's, that's, that's the way I feel, is my time is more, more important than my money. I wish I had a lot more time, believe it. Like about 20 more years, you know, added on. But, but time. When you are asking someone to give you their time, it's just as valuable or more valuable than asking them to give you your money. So you're asking for a sale. You're trying to sell them on getting it. A lot of people, that's their big hang up is I can't get an appointment. So think of it as a sale. You're selling the customer on letting you in the door, giving you their time. It's always a no obligation free estimate. Always, always, always. I mean, and so you, know, you make that point. When you're setting appointments, and this is more of a residential thing, but it's true of all uh, a sales, whether it's commercial or residential. Try to get all the decision makers in the room as much as possible. Uh, in residential, I used to make a big point of saying that both parties of the couple have to be there. So if I'm calling to set an appointment with you, and, uh, and, and I, I would normally ask, uh, well, so are you and your wife going to both be home? And Oh no, she's got a Pilates class. It's just going to be me. Was there? Is there another time we can schedule it when both of you will be around? Because realistically, I, I mean, I'd like to be able to, you know, answer all your questions at one time. You know, I mean, I'm going to make the trip out to your house and, and go through stuff. And 
Oh, well, I think this can be okay with me. Well, I, I would really prefer, is there some time, I really pushed that. I really didn't want to set an appointment with them if I couldn't get both of them in the room. Now, I had a little debate with people at previous classes on this because some people say, oh, you know, I do, I do fine with one-leggers. People who, I just get the mother, I just get the wife, just get the husband. You know, they'll buy. My results weren't that well. Of course, I had a very high standard. I wanted to close them all. And when I got to an application or got to a place and, and I couldn't close because, oh, I, you know, I have to talk to my wife, then I wasted my time. I mean, not, not that I didn't ever get those sales again, but it, it's, not, it's very hard. So my opinion is try to get all the decision makers as much as possible in a room. Um, I actually went to a job once or a, an appointment once that I had set, and um, I was supposed to be seeing both, both uh, husband and the wife, and I walk up to the door, and, and uh, the wife was gone. And I'm saying, you know what? Why don't we try to schedule this another time? Oh, no, 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 no. You know, I, I, come on. We're, you're here right now. I'd like you to do it. I said, but yeah, but I, you know, I, I, I can't really answer your wife's questions and all that kind of stuff. She says, no, no problem. I, I can make the decision. He got it. He understood that I, that I made a trip out there to, be, to see them and work with them on an alarm system, not, not necessarily to just do it for my health. So in commercial applications, I got to find the decision maker. Who is that decision maker? Usually, it's the guy at the top, but not always. It, commercial is a multi-call close. Okay, Very rarely are you going to go into a commercial and you're going to make the sale, bam. Sometimes it happens. But not always, usually not, I would say. Um, business to business sales is more like this. It's relationship building. It's a long-term commitment and, and uh, a process that goes along with it. So you want to know the CEO. You want to make sure you're in touch with that president. But he may or may not be the decision maker. However, even if he delegates that authority to somebody else in the organization, you want to keep that person in the loop. Okay, because they are, regardless of whether they are the decision maker, they are an influencer in the decision making process. So make sure to stay in touch with them, regardless of whether or not that you actually spend most of your time talking to somebody else in the organization. When you're trying to get through to large commercial accounts, and it's especially hard to get through when there's a bigger company and they have a gatekeeper. Uh, and typically that's a secretary, sometimes a receptionist, sometimes an assistant manager or something like that that's there basically to take all of the sales calls that are coming in or sales, uh, are people like yourself who don't maybe warrant the, uh, uh, an audience with the Pope. Um, in this case, there is no magic bullet. There's, no, there's been books written about how you get around the gatekeepers and how different things you did. I, I'm not going to give you a lot of smoke and mirrors because I tried them and a lot of them don't work. Okay. But now, it, this I've determined is a sale to. You now have to sell that secretary or that receptionist. You've got to convince them that you deserve an audience, that you deserve an opportunity. So when you call and you're trying to get through the gatekeeper, you find out their name so that when you call the next time, you can say, hi, Gene. Uh, this is Dwayne calling again. I'm trying to you know, get a hold of Mr. Jones. Uh, but..." Uh, uh, I know that he's, he's really busy. Um, can you just pass along one thing? I know he's you know, important that, 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 uh, that he understand that I can save him some money. Just let him know that. Okay. So you keep going at it and going at it. And eventually, if you sell the person, they, they, will let you, they will let you through and you can talk to the guy. And, um, but it, it is as much of a sale in some cases as, as actually selling the company itself to get through to them to start the process going. To win a large account, Okay, we're in the door here. To, to win it, the best thing to do is to learn their business, to learn what, what is important to them. If they're doing retail, for example, you've got to understand shrinkage and, all, and how that impacts their business, both in terms of shoplifting and in terms of internal theft. You, that you, so you need to understand the, the, the buzzwords and the phrases that, that have meaning that meaning to them, the hot buttons that are, that, are, that are important. Almost every one of these companies has their little hot button list of the, of the words or, or, or phrases that are now the, uh, the, the thing that they're all paying attention to. Um, those special considerations can set you apart. And, I, and I'll tell you today, there are some companies that, uh, we, that NAPCO does business with that are small companies, and some of them working out of homes, okay, who do business lot of business for large national chain accounts. You do not have to be a huge company to do that kind of business. 
What you do have to do is have a network of dealers around the country that can help make that happen. And NAPCO, if you ever get an opportunity to do that kind of work, NAPCO can help you with because we have dealers already doing this kind of work all over the United States for whom we've helped develop a dealer network all over the U.S. So you can do a lot of very big business as, as a very small company if you, if you take the time to learn their business and become a specialist at that particular kind of business. Because these people were. They were doing special things designed specifically to attract and maintain this kind of customer. Also get to know everybody you can in the organization. Because again, even if they're not decision makers, they can be influencers in the decision making process. And they can stop you from getting the sale. One of the best examples on my side of the business is trying to sell companies like you guys control panels. And I convince the owner to start looking at, at our control panel and testing our control panels out. And the minute that owner says, hey, look, uh, to his senior technician, I'd like you to try and put this NAPCO panel in. What are you talking about? I know Honeywell backwards and forwards. I'm never going to put in a NAPCO panel. Goes, no, if I say you're going to put in NAPCO, uh, whatever, yeah, yeah, you know. I had actually had the guy, uh, the DSC guy, send me, send me a panel uh, when I was a dealer. And uh, I went to my lead technician and I said, here, I want to, don't, he didn't have an alarm system in his own home like a lot of people, right? And I said, I said, here, put this in your own house. Try it out. See what you think. About a month later, I get a call back from the DSC guy. He says, he says well, uh, what did you think of that panel? I said, you know, I gave it to my lead tech. I don't know if you put it in. I called him up. No, I haven't had a chance to do it yet. Oh, okay. Well, I, let's all tell, I told the guy, okay, he's going he's gonna to put it in a few weeks. Well, a few weeks later, of course, he still hadn't put it in. So I actually told the guy, I said, okay, I want you, I'm going to pay you to go home and put it in your own house to put the darn thing in. And he like, grumble, 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 grumble. And then about... One o'clock in the afternoon, I get a call from the DSC rep, and he says, Dwayne, don't worry about it. You're not going to get your business. This guy doesn't even want to listen. You know, he's, so even though that technician was not the decision maker, he was certainly a major influencer in my business. He was making it really hard for me to consider alternative products. And that may be the same thing with you. If there are relationships and things that you have to get over, you have to do that over time. It's just a different learning experience. OK, so we've gotten through the door. We're doing the lead generation now. Uh, we're past that point. We're actually getting a chance to talk to the customer. Now, this is a residential piece, but it's kind of an interesting piece because it, it, it's, it's something that you wouldn't think really matters that much. But it can. It can. So when you approach the door, you walk up to the door, you ring the doorbell, and you knock. Why do you knock? A lot of times, doorbells don't work, right? So if you hit the doorbell and you hear a ding, 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 then you know that you don't have to knock. But I always used to hit the doorbell and knock. It was just become part of my thing. Um, and believe it or not, don't look at the door. Some people actually use that little peephole thing. And you know what annoys them? Is they look through and they see some guy looking back at them. It's like, holy cow, you know, I don't know if I want this guy in my house. You know? I, so, so what you do, what you do is, is you knock on the door, ring the doorbell, and then you turn around and enjoy the neighborhood. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Gorgeous. And that way when they open the door, you're not looking at them. And you turn around, hi, how are you doing? My name's Dwayne. What am I doing? I'm wiping my feet, because what is somebody wiping their teeth feet? What are they going to do? They're going to come into your house, right? Right. You're not going to say no to somebody's wiping their feet, you know? I mean, uh, if they're not wearing shoes, you, uh, always you have to ask them, you know, you want me to take my shoes off? A lot of times they'll say no. Sometimes they'll say yes. Whatever it is. Do what you're, but that, believe it or not, that handshake and wipe, feet, it, it works. It's one of those little silly, simple things that, that absolutely works. And then, okay, you know, you're walking in the door. The first thing you do Big smile, you're a very happy person. You look around, what's on the walls? Is there pictures of the family? They got a big deer head up on the wall. They got a fish that they caught. They got a picture of their bike, you know. Whatever it is that, that, that turns them on is on the walls or somewhere in the house. And you want to identify one of those things. And you want to say, hey, that's a nice looking bike. And, oh, really? You like that bike? You've got to see what I have in the garage, man. And they take you into the garage and show you the bike, and then you've got to get them away from the, hey, we're here to stay in the warm system. <laughs> you can know, spend the whole day talking about bikes. But the fact is you're warming up the customer. You're getting, them, you're getting to know them, and they're getting to know you okay, in the process. This is, this is just a warm-up, just to say, hey, look, I'm the kind of guy that, that cares about my customers. I want to know who you are and what, what's, what's important to you. And um, that's all you're doing is, is just getting, getting to know their interests, their children, et cetera, without getting too deeply into it, but you're trying to uh, get the ball rolling. Once you've gotten moving, you want to set up, and, and again, this is residential, not necessarily commercial, you want to set up in the kitchen. 
Where are all decisions made in the home? They're made at the kitchen table. You know, where the kids go to college, you know, how you're going to pay off the mortgage, yada, special deals, etc. Vacation plans are all done at the kitchen table. If they try to set you up in the living room, you're going to hang back and watch TV. It's not going to work. You want to be at the kitchen table where the, decision, where the decisions are made. Now, sometimes you have no choice, but you, you, you've got to, uh, that's where you would like to do. So you take control of the call by setting up where you need to set up uh, in order to uh, be most effective. Um, commercially, uh, this is a trick that I find it's more, I don't know if it's intentional or it's just the way some people are, but they have this nice office chair. They're sitting up like this, and the chair that they have you sit in is like down here. So you're looking at them like this, you know. Hey, little guy down there, you know. I'm, uh, you, 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 want it, you want it as much as possible, get on their height. Now, you can't stand up, so what you do is you sit towards the front of the chair, sit up as highly as possible, but you want to get as close to eye level as you can because there is a psychological benefit to being, to being higher, okay? And you set the agenda, okay? You've always let the customer try to maintain control or to think that they're in control of the sales call, but you keep the process moving forward. Site survey, when you sit down and you go through the presentation, and then when you're finished with the presentation, you got the proposal, and then you have a little bit of discussion and back and forth, and then you try to close. But you keep the ball mulling. Again, let them think they're in control, but you keep the process moving forward, okay? Hot buttons. These are one of the few things. I remember I told you there's a few things that I'm going to highlight as being the most important things that I can talk to you about. This ranks up there. It is one of the biggest failings of sales representatives of all levels. People that I work with who've been doing this for decades have this issue. They walk into a room to talk to you to try to sell you something, and they immediately launch into their presentation. I, I love this idea. I'm going to spend 20 minutes talking to you about fire radios and telling them how wonderful fire radios are, and then about 20 minutes later when you finally have a chance to get a word in edgewise, you say, Dwayne, I, I really don't do commercial fire. I, I've just wasted 20 minutes of my time and yours, you know, trying to, trying to sell you something that you're not going to buy, okay? So you've got to ask questions. The most important thing I can teach you is ask questions because the more questions you ask, the more people will tell you how to sell them. They will tell you what they want. Uh, people love talking about themselves. They love talking about their families, their homes, their favorite whatever things that they do. So you have to care about they, what they care about, so listen carefully. There's that cliche, right, that you have two ears and one mouth so you can, talk, you can listen twice as much as you talk. In my view, there should be four ears in one, one mouth because you should listen about four times as much as you talk. You should really let them talk and let them go on because they will sell themselves. They love talking about themselves. They will convince themselves because you are the one who's hearing what they have to say. You're hearing their needs and their concerns. They will tell you how to sell them. You need to find out why you are there and what scares them. I used to have a sales guy that worked for me uh, who was uh, a real professional sales guy who came from selling big uh, farm tractors and things like that. And uh, he, uh, he would you know, work with me to set appointments. We'd get the leads in and we'd call up people and set appointments. And, so, and he told me one day we were talking about it and he says that you know, when he walks into a customer, he says the very first question that he, he sits down and he asks is, is, so why am I here? And I say, well, didn't you set the appointment? <laughs> I mean, don't, and I, if I was on the other side of the table, I don't know, you set the appointment, why are you here? You know? uh, but the truth is, is that why am I here is a valid question. Because you let me in the door to spend some time talking about security or fire or whatever it is. What is it that was most important? Why am I here? Why are you, what are you thinking about? What's, what's made you actually decide to sit down and talk to a professional about, about an alarm system or some kind of security or fire protection for your family? And, and it's a valid point. It's a, it's a, it's a good, good point. Do you have a question? Yeah, sure. We have a uh, saying, listen in 3D, for dreams, desires, and disappointments. There you go. And one of those three things that gets people to buy. Dreams, desires, and disappointments. I like that. Listen. 
for dreams, desires, and disappointments. These, these are the, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great line. This is the kinds of things that actually have, uh, that have power with people. It, it, it moves them when, when you understand them and you, and you are, are listening to what they think. Like I said, there's very few things that I'm going to teach you today. I have talked to pros, or seen pros in, at work who, do, who, who don't understand this and don't use this properly. So find out why you're there, what scares them, and then tailor the responses and proposals to their needs. The definition of sales is find a need and fill it. First half of that is finding the need. You cannot find the need if you're talking. You've got to find a need and then you show your customer how you are going to be able to help them fill that need. And once you get past this, once you've got decided that you're actually, now you understand what they're doing and, and what they need, now it's time to teach them. In my personal opinion, sales is a teaching profession. A lot of people look at this as, as a manipulative kind of process. I think that you're going to buy from me because you because I teach you why my product is better, why you should use my product, what about it is, is superior than my is to my competition. Okay, So I have to teach you, I have to educate you on why that's better. So you do the same to your customers. Occasionally you'll, you'll run into the knowledgeable buyer, Okay, and that's not a bad thing. Knowledgeable buyers are, are, are good because a lot of people have had alarm systems before, a lot of people have maybe done some research before they called you or, or, or uh, met with you. So, you know, honor their understanding. Let them talk about it and maybe, you know, uh, direct them here and there to respond to certain particular issues they might have. But uh, teach them about the systems that you install. Why they are, uh, you're suggesting certain types of protection for their business or their home. Offer them the options. Why do you choose, in some cases, to use a glass break sensor to protect the windows and others to put window contacts or window protection of some kind? Explain to them why the, the trade-offs are involved. Compromises to achieve budget restrictions are not bad. Sometimes people just can't afford what they need. So you start them out with something that they absolutely positively need right now and then you say, we can always add more protection later. One of the great things about our business is if, is if I want to uh, sell you a system, I can sell you a system that starts with this and then grows into this and then grows into this and then grows into this and it can keep expanding to become everything you possibly could want it to be over time and, and within the realm of your, of your budget. If I'm going to buy a refrigerator and I want to buy a Sub-Zero that's an $8,000 refrigerator or something, I'm probably not going to buy it because I have to buy it, bam, one shot. With, with us, we don't have that, we don't have that, that restriction. Okay, so teach them about the systems you install and why your systems are superior. This is actually one of those little irky things that gets me, is that people say, I'm a no pressure salesman. What that means is that you're not a salesman to me. If there's no pressure, it's not sales. And I'm not saying pressure like pushy, like you definitely have to buy from me today or buy, but there's got to be a little bit of sense of urgency. There's got to be a, a reason why it's time to make a decision. How many people do you know that, that never can make a decision? They're, they're, I mean, they sit there and they'll, they'll dilly-dally and consider and talk for hours and whatever and go on and on and on. And uh, I think it takes salesmanship uh, to, to, uh, to, to really uh, do it right. Um, so you be tactful, but you have to ask for the order. You have to push for the sale, okay? Don't give up when you get objections. Don't give up. Never agree with the customer's objections. When they object to something, you don't say, oh, you're, you're right, because <laughs> then, then they win. What you say is, I understand why you feel that way, but one of my favorite in this case is, is uh, Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney, I, I didn't necessarily agree with him politically on a lot of stuff, but he would sit there and these guys would bash him with all the things. Why did this and this and this and this happen? And, and I can't, and why did you do that? And, and he, looks at, they look, he looks across the table at this one interviewer one day and he says, sorry, John, I don't see it that way. So it's not that, it's not that you're wrong. It's just I don't see it the same way you did. You know, this is how I see it. And this is why I've drawn the conclusions that I've come to. So you're not saying they're wrong. 
You're just saying that, they're, that, that, that they are uh, uh, maybe not seeing the entire picture, okay? So you're not telling them that, 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 that you're smarter than they are. You're just saying that this is a different way of looking at the same information. No is just another objection. It's just an objection. Haven't you ever changed your mind when presented with new information? Yes, go ahead. Personally, residentially, they get a proposal from me that night. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but that's because I believe that when you're in a residential sale, you try to, you try to close. But so I, I think that the proposal thing commercially is absolutely necessary. That's the way you do it. But residentially, I would, I would do it when I'm there, I per personally. Um, and, and honestly, when you're sitting in front of a customer, one of the things that's, that's important, again, to create this sense of urgency, because this is an important thing. Sense of urgency means I have to do it. I can't keep putting it off. How many people that you've visited and maybe seen and tried to sell alarm systems to over the past never bought from anybody? Forget they didn't buy from you. They didn't buy from anybody. I got, I got a really st a, a kind of horrible story. We used to do a lot of business in Patterson, and there was this one house that we had visited that we had gotten a lot of interest. The woman there it was a, a multi-story home. She had tenants, etc. And uh, we kept talking to her about an alarm system. And of course, part of what I pushed too heavily was info was fire. And um, we went back there two or three times to try to get her to buy this alarm system. And she just didn't want to spend the money. One day, we went back there, and the house had burned down. And unfortunately, a, a little girl had passed away in the process. And you know, people have to make decisions at some point. You know, if she'd made a decision, the world might have changed. You know, she wouldn't make a decision. I mean, and obviously there was money issues. I'm not trying to pretend that there wasn't reasons why she didn't do it. But not making decisions are decisions. Okay, so we need to make sure that the customers know and remember why they were there, why you, why they brought you in, why you're there. And, and oftentimes, that's enough to create that kind of sense of urgency. A little pressure is actually a good thing. OK, we're going to take about a 10, 15 minute break so everybody can uh, have a minute to do the bathroom thing and to uh, you know, make a phone call, answer whatever, and, um, and we'll start again.